Hello and welcome to Cap Tips, ideas for the search and rescue and emergency services communities of Civil Air Patrol. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the Garmin G1000 Search and Rescue Package. It's an option available on some G1000 equipped aircraft. In addition to the basic features and functionality of the Search and Rescue Package, we're also going to be talking a little bit about how to employ it effectively for your missions. Let's begin with an overview of what you need to know about the Garmin SAR Package. First of all, the Search and Rescue Package is an option on G1000 equipped aircraft, though according to Garmin, it can be added as an aftermarket accessory. Two, it will help air crews plan and execute three different search patterns, parallel, sector, and expanding square. Three, the entire system is based on latitude and longitude, not CAP grids, so extra care is important in your pre-flight planning. Four, the system aids the air crew maintain situational awareness by visualizing complex patterns and helping the air crew realize where they are within those patterns during the course of the flight. And finally, the SAR package reduces the in-cockpit workload on the mission observer and mission scanner, thereby allowing them to focus the majority of their attention on out-of-cockpit responsibility. Now, there are some important limitations to bear in mind as we look at the SAR package. First of all, more care and time is required for the pre-flight planning than the Apollo GX-55 that many air crews are familiar with today. Two, because the system is not based on the cap grid system, air crews will need to take care to ensure that they stay within their own grid, as well as entering all the necessary calculations, including latitude and longitude, as part of their pre-flight preparations. While surveying grid corners is one of the first tasks an air crew does upon arriving in grid, the system on the G1000 does not automatically add the grid corners and flying the grid corners as part of the flight plan. Air crews will need to add that manually separately. Because the system does not record the actual track of the aircraft or the breadcrumb trail on the screen, it is more difficult for the air crew to determine their search effectiveness while still in the air. For a parallel line search, the minimum search spacing is 0.5 nautical miles, which may prove to be problematic for air crews conducting searches in heavily wooded terrain, where quarter mile spacing is typically recommended. And finally, the sector search pattern is limited to three sectors or three slices of the pie, as opposed to a full set that many air crews are familiar with. Our first task is to confirm installation of the G1000 SAR package. First, hit the Flight Plan key. Then, hit the Menu key. At the top of the options, you should see Search and Rescue. If it's not present, the SAR package is not installed on your G1000 aircraft. Now let's take a look at the basic menus of the SAR package. Hit enter under search and rescue in the flight plan menu options. And that's going to bring us into this screen where we can go ahead and configure the three different flight plan configurations that are available on the G1000 SAR package. Expanding square, sector search, and parallel line. Here's a quick refresher of the three different mission profiles. Parallel line, sector, and expanding square. We'll take a look at each in detail right now. Let's begin with a parallel line search pattern. There are a number of inputs which are required for the G1000 to set up the search pattern. These need to be calculated before coming to the aircraft during pre-flight planning. Let's take a look now at each of these inputs and what's required. First and foremost is the waypoint. This is any point either from the navigational database or a user entered waypoint on the G1000. Now this waypoint acts as a keystone for the rest of the search grid. The orientation of, of the rest of the grid, the initial track, the number of tracks, the spacing, number of legs, all that will be based upon this initial point. So it's important that it is entered accurately to ensure that the rest of the grid will also be aligned accurately. Next is the initial track. And this is the magnetic course that you want to fly once you've arrived at the initial point or the waypoint. So in other words, you arrive at this corner, what heading do you now want to take to begin the first leg of your search grid? Uh, all subsequent legs will be parallel to this initial track. So again, ensure that you've correctly calculated for the fact that it is a magnetic heading and entered it correctly in this blank. The next field is the initial turn. And this is the turn either to the left or right that you'll make upon completing the initial leg of your search pattern. And this can be based upon either which corner of the grid you've flown to or terrain considerations and so forth. All subsequent turns at the end of the legs will also be parallel to this. So all will be left, all will be right, however you've entered it here. Next we come to leg length or the length that each of the search legs will be in your grid. For a cap quarter grid, 
north-south, these will be 7.5 nautical miles in length for the state of Washington, or 5 nautical miles for an east-west quarter grid in the state of Washington. The actual lengths of these legs will be dependent upon your latitude, so ensure that you've accurately calculated this for your area of operations. Our next input is track spacing, or the distance between each of our search legs. This value will be determined by the specific terrain and conditions that you'll be operating in for your search. For example, here in western Washington, where we typically operate in heavily wooded mountainous terrain, quarter mile spacing is generally recommended. In open areas or over water, much further track spacing is likely warranted. Because the G1000 SAR package can only go down to a minimum of 0.5 nautical mile track spacing, we actually set up the search for half mile track spacing and then fly additional legs in between the ones that are actually depicted on the G1000 screen. This allows us to get the extra legs in while still maintaining the visualization that we want setting up a parallel line search. Finally, we reach the number of legs that we will need to fly as part of our search pattern. And this is a function of the amount of area that we want to cover and the track density or track spacing we've previously selected. For example, if we're flying north-south legs with half mile spacing and a standard cap grid, we'll need to fly 10 legs to complete the area that we need to search. This table helps visualize the relationship between the various calculations we've just discussed. In this first row, we can see that if we're flying a quarter cap grid with north-south legs, it would take 10 legs at half mile track spacing with each leg being 7.5 nautical miles. Now please note that this data is intended for the state of Washington between 46 and 49 degrees north latitude. Additional legs will be required if you're further south depending upon the track spacing. So please verify these calculations are still accurate in your area. Now let's bring everything we've just discussed together and set up an actual parallel line search on the G1000. For our initial point, we're going to select a waypoint we've already entered into the user database, in this case 231 Charlie, and the southeast corner of that grid. We're going to go ahead and verify that the latitude and longitude is accurate based on our pre-flight planning, and hit enter. Now we can come in and enter the other data points that we've just discussed. We want a parallel line search. We want the magnetic heading upon reaching that initial point to be 343 degrees. And we need to select whether we're going to make a left or right turn at the end of that first leg, in this case left. What is our leg length going to be? Well, since we're flying north-south legs and the north latitudes here, it'll be 7.5 nautical miles. And we're going to select half mile spacing. Even if we want more dense in this case, perhaps a quarter mile spacing, we'll still select 0.5 nautical miles and then fly additional legs in between the waypoints that will be visualized. Last, we'll also select the number of legs that we need. Now, an important point here is that uh, we've selected to fly direct to a grid corner. Now, if we first, upon reaching our grid, are going to do a survey to visually identify our grid corners, uh, and then we want to be able to actually conduct our parallel line search within that, we may want to offset that initial point from where the grid corner would actually be. Now, once we've got everything entered, we'll go ahead and double check that all the data is correct, and then we'll go ahead and come down one more level and hit Activate SAR and you can see that it's gone ahead and set up a flight plan based upon the calculations we've just given with all the waypoints entered into our flight plan automatically. Now using the range knob we can scroll down and take a look at our handiwork and we can see what the flight plan looks like visualized on the MFD. In this case we can see where we're flying down to the southeast corner and then as the G1000 leads us through a number of maneuvers as we fly each of these legs. We can see everything's been entered as a waypoint, so it's fairly clear on the screen exactly what we'll be doing in the course of this flight. So now let's take a look at the process of setting up an expanding square pattern. As before, there are a number of important pieces of data that we need to provide for the G1000 to set up the course, all of which need to be pre-calculated as part of the pre-flight planning before coming to the aircraft, including the initial waypoint, as well as information about the legs and leg length. We begin with the all-important initial point, and this is a point that can be derived either from the navigational database or from the user-entered waypoint database. And this will be the initial point from which all of the rest of the legs will be based upon. Enter the desired magnetic heading to be taken once the initial point is reached. Specify the turn direction that needs to be taken once the initial leg is completed. 
and specify the spacing that needs to be taken for each of the subsequent legs. Finally, enter the number of legs that must be flown as part of this expanding square pattern. Now let's take a look at how all this looks on the G1000 by setting up an expanding square search. First, we'll select a waypoint. In this case, we're going to go ahead and use 231 Charlie, but select the northeast corner of the grid. This will now be the center of our expanding square. We'll select expanding square, select the magnetic heading of the first leg from the initial point, the rest of the expanding square will orient around this, and then select the left or right turn that we want to make at the end of our first leg. Spacing in this case will select one nautical mile, and then we'll select the number of legs that we want to fly outwardly from that initial point. Once all the information is entered correctly, and we're satisfied with the data, we'll go ahead and select Activate SAR. And again, this will populate a flight plan. As we take a look at how this is visualized on the screen, we can see all the different legs, including waypoints that have been automatically selected for us. Now imagine this on the MFD, with cues being fed to the pilot on the PFD automatically. This will substantially reduce the workload on the Emission Observer and the Mission Scanner, and allow both to spend the majority of their time focused outside the aircraft on visual search or other mission-related tasks, substantially increasing success of the mission. Now let's take a look at setting up a sector search pattern on the G1000. Now the sector search pattern that is used on the G1000 only flies three sectors, as you can see depicted here. To configure this, we still must enter a number of pieces of data that are required and that we must prepare during our pre-flight planning. First and foremost, of course, is the initial point, followed by information about our legs. Once again, we begin with the all-important waypoint or initial point. For a sector search, this will form the center of all of our search patterns. So we'll continue to pass back over this point time and again as we fly each of the sectors. Next, we'll once again enter the magnetic heading that we want to take once we reach the initial point. Next, we select whether we want to make a left or right turn at the end of this initial leg. And finally, we enter the length of the legs that we want to fly. And this will be determined by the size of the sectors that we've been assigned or that we desire to fly as part of our search. In this video, we've looked at the Garmin G1000 Search and Rescue Package, an option available on some G1000 equipped aircraft. In addition to the basic features and functionality covered in this video, there are a number of excellent references available for you. Take a look at the links at the end of this video, including the manual provided by Garmin. Thank you for watching and Semper Vigilance.